All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's 12 o'clock, and we want to be really respectful of your schedules because I know it takes a lot to take time out of your day. I'm uh, Kristen Kirkby Shaw. I am one of the surgeon, surgeons and rehab specialists here at Animal Surgical and Sound. And on behalf of everyone here in this practice, we really want to thank you guys for joining us today and then also for your um, continued support over the years. And uh, we also really hope that you guys are all well and staying healthy and safe out there. I know um, everybody's having the, the challenges of being busy these days. And so hopefully you're finding some time with your families um, to get some of that downtime too. So, all right, just a couple of housekeeping things here. We are going to save all questions till the very end. So if you have questions that come up uh, throughout this presentation, just go ahead and throw them into the Q&A section. Um, you should be able to see that on your screen there. So any questions that you have, go in Q&A. If there's any technical issues, if you can't hear, if you if there's trouble um, with any of the, the AV side of it, please throw that into the chat box. Um, we've got the wonderful Izzy Barnes here um, from Animal Surgical manning the, uh, the chat room and uh, helping with any IT issues there. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And before we launch into the actual presentations, I have to acknowledge that we wouldn't be able to bring these presentations to you without the generous support of our sponsors. And so the three sponsors we have for today's talk are actually the um, makers of the three breakthrough treatments that we're going to be talking about. So thank you so much to Exubrion, Zoetis, and HVM. And um, I'm always obligated to disclose that I'm a paid consultant for a few different companies. So that's my obligation. All right, so let's get into it. The outline, what we're gonna talk about, um, before we talk about how we treat OA, I always like to have everyone on the same page of what are we talking about. So OA pathophysiology, um, maybe a little couple new things that, that may um, you may have not been aware of in terms of the pathophysiology of OA, diagnosing it. Of course, you know we can't treat it unless we know what we're treating. Um, really briefly, what do we have currently available? Now, this is the, the point of the, the presentations where I wish we could had you know, an entire day dedicated to it, but we don't. So I'm going to share with some resources with you that you can, on your own time, um, dive into some of the uh, current treatments. And then what the future holds. And we're going to talk about Synovitin OA, anti-NGF monoclonal antibodies, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Okay, so OA is an inflammatory condition. And you know, I use slides like this um, very frequently when I talk about OA, and I actually just added this bullet point because I had a, a conversation with a friend of mine who's a rehab and sports medicine vet recently, and she made a comment about osteoarthritis not being an inflammatory condition. And I was like, whoa, 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 it is an inflammatory condition. And I think there's a big misconception out there that if you don't have neutrophils, it's not inflammatory. So osteoarthritis is not a neutrophilic inflammation, but it is very much an inflammatory condition. That's why we use anti-inflammatories. So it's local inflammation at the joint level, but it's also systemic inflammation. This is why we know the importance of weight loss and how uh, weight, you know, weight gain and weight loss can directly um, impact the progression of osteoarthritis. So OA in, a, in and of itself is this vicious cycle of inflammation and degeneration within the joint. And the degener degeneration comes about by a number of different products and enzymes. And then these trigger the re release of various different um, pain mediators of which we're all very familiar with prostaglandin E, you know, that's our, our main target with our NSAIDs. But there's literally probably thousands, but there's at least a dozen these days that drug companies and various people are working on to find as new targets to, you know, to treat pain. And NGF is one where in particular, we're gonna talk more about as a really exciting area that um, might really revolutionize and change how, how we manage OA pain. This is part of the, the concept of osteoarthritis is an inflammatory condition. And the source of inflammation is actually synovial macrophages. And this is an area where there's a lot of research these days on the human side, just looking at the role that these macrophages play. And really the, the, what the macrophages are doing, and so remember macrophages are basically monocytes that migrated to the tissue. And there's technically two different macrophages. They can select into either 
type one macrophages or type two macrophages. And there's supposed to be a good regulation between these good macrophages, bad macrophages. It's not as easy as that, but the macrophages are all right, so sorry guys, what would a Zoom webinar be without IT issues? So really, really sorry about that. Hopefully um, we don't have that issue again. Anyway, um, point being that macrophages are the bad guys in the joint, they release the um, inflammatory products. So why is all this important when it comes to OA management? Well, obviously we wanna control the in, that individual pain episode, that one event, whether it's the dog can't run and jump at the dog park or they're sore one day or the cat's having trouble jumping onto the furniture. But the bigger problem is what happens if we leave this osteoarthritic pain unmanaged over time, over months and years. And what happens is there's a, literally a change to the nervous system called neuroplasticity and we get the development of neuropathic pain. And this is ultimately what we're really trying to avoid. And in order to avoid this, we have to get on top of managing OA as early as possible. So that means diagnosing OA as early as possible. In dogs, osteoarthritis is almost always secondary to an underlying condition of the joint. So developmental orthopedic diseases are inevitably going to lead to OA. So these are gonna be hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, MPL. Other predisposing causes, cruciate tear. 100% of the time if a dog has a cruciate tear, they are going to develop OA. So we know at that time that the cruciate tears, we have to have a bigger conversation, not just about surgery, but how we manage this dog long-term. Any sort of joint trauma. So if a dog has, a, or a cat has trauma to their joint as a young dog, they're at risk of having a long-term consequence associated with that. Obesity, we know at least 50% of our pets out there are overweight or obese. We talked about systemic inflammation directly related to inflammation in the joint. So that's absolutely a predisposing condition. So diagnosing OA really starts with this index of suspicion. If these dogs or cats meet any of these conditions I just mentioned, there's a really good chance that they're going to develop OA. Then of course the physical exam, um, we're not gonna talk in detail about the physical exam here um, or diagnostic imaging, but I do wanna introduce a couple screening tools that um, may be able to help you at least kind of identify these animals that you can spend a little bit more time diving in and, and diagnosing the, that OA. And the first one is the idea of a, ch a client checklist. And you may already have this in your practice. Um, it may be part of the intake paperwork. And these days, maybe you have the clients filling it out online. But the idea is that it's asking questions around mobility and maybe specifically asking about pain. But asking clients to you know, think about their pet in their home environment. Um, and it brings their awareness to these conditions or these mobility concerns that are very indicative of OA. And what this does is it opens the door for you to have a conversation with the client. They may be coming to see you for a completely different reason, you know, itchy ears or vaccines, but they've identified, <clears throat> they've kind of self-identified that, yeah, their dog actually does have trouble going up and down the stairs. And so the other thing it does is you may not have time to talk about everything there is to talk about in OA in this particular visit, but you can send them home with information to prepare for the next visit. And so there's a lot of different checklists out there. The one I'm showing here is one that was created by Zoetis. And what I like about it is it, you know, shows these, these kind of caricatures, these little pictures that, um, you know, I know when, um, when I'm talking to, to groups in, uh, in person, I always ask, you know, when's the last time you had a client come in that said, well, my dog's limping, but I don't think they're in pain. And usually most of the people in, in the audience raise their hand and, you know, it happens to me on a daily basis that clients don't know what pain looks like. They don't necessarily associate a limp with pain. And using some of these checklists can help get them in that mindset. So, you know what, slow to rise. It's not just that the dog's getting older, it's that, yeah, they probably have arthritis and their joints hurt. So there was a study that was done looking at that particular checklist that I just showed you. And what they found was that almost 40% of clients that were seen for a wellness exam that felt, filled out this checklist, 37% of them identified at least one thing on this questionnaire that led the veterinarian to go on and dig a little bit deeper and do a full orthopedic exam, in which case 70% of those dogs had OA in at least one joint. So what this means is we are under-recognizing OA. There's that 
kind of statistic that has been thrown around. Um, it came out of one paper in the 1990s that said 20% of dogs have OA. And I think um, most people are gonna agree these days that that statistic is actually a lot higher. Well, <clears throat> what about cats? So um, cats are, are, you know, we're not gonna neglect cats. We can't, um, we definitely shouldn't do that, but they're a little bit different, right? So this video is, um, it's from Zoetis, and I think it's really nice and it can help clients, again, identify what behaviors may be occurring in their home that indicate that their cat has joint disease. And it may, uh, you know, especially with cats more than dogs, you know, they're not gonna cry out in pain. It's going to be really subtle changes. Um, you know, some, like some of the things depicted here, trouble doing the things that are normal in their daily life. This video is really cute. Um, the, this along with that uh, questionnaire that I showed a few slides back, I'm sure your Zoetis rep could provide you with it. This video is a couple minutes long and for the sake of time, I'm not gonna play the whole thing now, but I have it at the very end of this um, presentation when we're doing Q&A, I'm gonna play it again for you just because I think it's really cute. All right, the second screening tool is a screening exam. And I've put this together to help you kind of identify when it's time to do a more thorough orthopedic exam. And so it starts again with that index of suspicion and you ask seven questions here. Is it a breed at risk? So this is when it's okay to be a breedist. Rottweilers and German Shepherds and Labradors are at a much higher likelihood to get OA compared to say a standard poodle. Um, is the dog overweight? So you can read through these seven questions and basically if you answer yes to any of these, that is a strong index of suspicion that you should dive a little bit deeper. Then there's seven exam techniques. And again, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into each one of these, but you are going to get um, in your email boxes at the end of this presentation, you're going to get a PDF copy of this screening exam. Um, you're also going to get information about how you can find, uh, I put together some actual videos that show me going through the orthopedic exam. So you can actually do this with your patients, the screening exam, and then the more thorough orthopedic exam. So this one was designed specifically for dogs. And then the question is, well, can we use the same thing for cats? You know, are cats just small dogs? And, you know, in certain scenarios, they can be awfully like um, small dogs. But what we know is really cats are not small dogs. And there's a lot of differences um, in everything that we do with cats, um, you know, including the diagnosis of OA. And this, uh, this slide is, is somewhat of a summary of a number of different studies that were done uh, several years ago, kind of looking at the general incidence of osteoarthritis in cats. And they were kind of basically just catagram radiographs done and not for specifically for the purpose of looking for OA in a lot of these, these, um, these studies, but they found that just incidentally, cats had, you know, up to 90% of them had spinal OA and up to 64% of them had appendicular OA. And then ultimately, this is one of Dr. LaSalle's studies, that 90% of cats have at least one joint that has osteoarthritis. So that's basically all of our cats that we're seeing, right? Um, and what we know is that the incidence definitely increases with age. With cats, it's, it's a little bit different. That's the main thing that has been shown to be associated with the development of OA. And this is what makes OA in cats a little bit different than dogs is OA in cats is a little bit more similar to um, what we recognize in humans, which is a primary osteoarthritis, a general wear and tear that just comes along with age versus dogs having that secondary OA that is almost always due to an underlying joint disorder. So if it was only as simple as that, say, okay, well, about 90% of cats have OA, you know, as they age, well, it's unfortunately not even quite as simple as that. There, this was a study that looked at cats that were um, being euthanized for unrelated reasons, and they did radiographs and then necropsies and found that basically radiographs were under-recognizing the amount of OA. So you can see the statistics here, you know, 42% of the elbows showed radiographic OA, but on necropsy, 72% had cartilage damage. Okay, so this is not surprising. I think we've, we've always known that radiographic changes lag behind what's actually happening at the tissue level. This is just confirmation specifically to cats. And then to complicate things even further with cats is that radiographic changes of OA only correlate with our physical exam about 30% of the time. And this is again, back to this um, 
old kind of saying that that we've always gone by is you know traditionally it's dogs don't walk on their x-rays well cats don't either so they may have pain on physical exam but the radiographs don't show anything and you may find radiographic changes that suggest OA but they may not have pain on physical exam so there's not a direct correlation in every case so the summary for our cat friends is that OA is very common in cats it's not just a dog disease Pain on palpation with normal radiographs, basically consider OA to be very likely. Um, if you don't get pain on your physical exam and you have normal radiographs, this is a time to start looking for those other things that are indicative pain. So decreased jumping, um, that's you know, gonna be a very common one. Are they sleeping more? It's, this holds true for dogs too. Are they, are they sleeping more? Or are they more even more restless? Over grooming, this is one that I, um, I come across a lot in talking to, to um, cat owners is that the, the cats are over grooming certain areas. So this picture here showing a cat over grooming their elbow. Licking is a soothing sensation uh, in dogs and cats. And so when they lick that joint area or they, it seems like you may want to jump to that they have allergies or OCD, um, really important to make sure that, that they're not actually painful. Um, and this holds true for dogs as well. So those dogs that tend to lick excess, excessively at their distal front limbs. Um, that can very much be related to uh, neuropathic pain associated with the neck or anywhere kind of in the forelimb. And then back to cats, changes in their litter box habits. So if they have mobility concerns that they're not able to get in and out of the litter box, um, they're, so they're urinating outside the litter box, defecating out, be sure to be looking for OA and not necessarily assume that it's a behavioral concern. All right, so then how do we treat OA? So whether we're talking about dogs or cats, in my mind, the, we're doing almost all of the same things, whether it's a dog or a cat. And this is my personal approach to how I, I go about um, developing a treatment plan for a patient with OA. And I call it a comprehensive care quad. And I came up with this because uh, one of our exam rooms has a big white wall, whiteboard is one of the walls, so it can, draw all over the, the wall. And I was finding myself just listing all of these different treatments and the you know clients, I would warn them up front, like, don't get overwhelmed. Um, the point of me writing a lot of things that we can do is that there's a lot of things that we can do. So I want there to be a, a feeling of hope that OA is not a death sentence. There's a lot of things we can do, but it just got kind of messy. So I was like, we need to organize this into a way that we can be systematic about our approach to treating OA. Um, and be comprehensive, make sure that we don't forget anything. And so I've got these four categories, pain management is always where we have to start, nutrition, nothing matters more than making sure that the patient is um, at an appropriate body weight. Lifestyle, this is the area that I think um, I spend a lot of time talking about and some, um, some people often overlook. So that's just the importance of having not having slick floors in the home. So yoga mats, rugs, making sure the nails are nice and trim. And then of course, you know, we'll talk about rehab techniques and there's a lot of rehab things that we can do to help manage OA, but you don't have to have an underwater treadmill. You do not have to have a laser in order to manage OA. So this is just a real world example of, of now how, how I go about it. I, I really do draw this quad onto the board in the old days, in the pre-COVID days. Um, now I still have the same conversation, but we're working through it systematically. For you guys, because we, um, you know, we're, we're limited, limited in our time here, and I really am excited to talk about these three emerging treatments. Um, I want you guys to be able to access all of the information about all of the things that you do have readily available. And so, uh, the website is caninearthritis.org, and you guys are going to get an email, like I said, at the end of this presentation, and you'll have this, this login information. You can take it down right now if you want, but you're going to have um, access to all of the content that's on this website. And it was specifically designed um, for veterinarians caring for dogs with arthritis to give you tools and resources to help you in your job, to make your job easier. I use these tools literally every single day. There's videos in there um, to share with your clients on how to apply an ice pack, how to do passive range of motion, um, what are some good exercises that they can do with their dogs to help build strength in the pelvic limbs. Um, there's a nutrition tool to help calculate how many calories the dog should be getting from food versus um, from, um, for, from treats. And then there's also, like I mentioned before, there's um, 
videos on how to do the physical exam component, how to do an Ortolani exam, how to do that screening exam, and then lots of articles that talk about all these different treatment methods that are in the care quad. So um, I hope you guys take advantage of this. There's uh, just a ton of content on there and I, I think it will be helpful for you. So for today, we are going to talk about these three emerging exciting new treatments that fall into the categories of needles and um, modalities. So the first one is this, um, you know, again, the needle category where it's something that we're delivering through needles. Synovitin OA and uh, NGF monoclonal antibody. And I will start off by saying that neither of these are available in the area quite yet. So the anti-NGF monoclonal antibody is a Zoetis product that is awaiting FDA approval. Um, and as soon as it's available, I think we, we will all be very excited about it. Synovitin, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. We'll get into that. And uh, we should hopefully be having this available very soon. So Synovitin is, um, it's actually a radioisotope, it's a radiopharmaceutical, it's a uh, radioactive tin. And the way that it works is this, um, the, you know, the, it's called a, a device um, rather than a drug, but you inject the product into the, um, into the arthritic joint. And this tiny little particle um, that's radioactive is engulfed by macrophages and synoviocytes. And I'm going to, Play a video for you that's going to give a really nice um, uh, show you how this happens in a nice kind of animated way. But what happens is those inflammatory cells in the joint engulf this radioactive molecule and they are deactivated. And by deactivating them, it decreases the release of inflammatory mediators. Um, and so what it does is it restores that synovial lining to its normal state and basically they're not allowed to say that it's modifying the disease process, but in, in ways that's what we're hoping that it's doing, is it's restoring that joint to a less inflammatory condition. Um, there's been quite a few studies in this, in dogs and in development for a very similar product uh, to come out in humans, but actually very similar technique has been used in Germany to treat tens of thousands of humans with arthritis. And it is very safe. Um, so no systemic uh, toxicity or side effects have been seen in, in any of the studies with dogs. And it decays, this radioactive tin decays to basically a harmless version of tin. And you know, I think the tendency when we're talking about um, nuclear medicine is to, to compare it to what we're very familiar with, with the I-131 with cats. And, um, you know, I, the idea of nuclear medicine and radioactive material is, can be scary, um, understandably, to, to clients and to us as well. Um, a big difference between Synovitin and I-131 is that, um, if you guys are familiar with I-131, those cats have to stay in the hospital for uh, several days. And that's because the I-131 is excreted in their urine and feces and it has to be a certain level um, that it gets to before they're allowed to be released to go home. Once they're in their home environment, the clients have to be very particular about, you know, taking care of the, that urine and feces. Synovitin is very different. It is actually doesn't leave the joint until it's an inert molecule. So it's not actually excreted in, um, in the urine or feces. So we'll talk a little bit more about the logistics of it in just a second, but do just want to show you the mechanism of action video because I think it's, um, it can be helpful to understand. Chronic osteoarthritis, or OA, is one of the most significant debilitating conditions in companion animal health, afflicting up to 20 million dogs in the U.S. Current treatment options can cause systemic side effects, are short-acting, or only target pain receptors and thus may not fully address this disease that creates such discomfort for the dog. Inside the OA disease joint, a vicious cycle of inflammation causes the synovial membrane to swell and the cartilage to deteriorate. The overproduction of inflammatory macrophages and synoviocytes creates ongoing... which is injected into the joint to safely and effectively treat synovitis for up to one year. The appropriately sized 10117M microparticles stay in the joint and emit low energy conversion electrons with only a 0.3 millimeter range of activity. 
This provides targeted, precise, non-systemic therapy with no clinically significant local or systemic side effects. Inflammatory macrophages and synoviocytes selectively engulf the synovitin OA microparticles and are subsequently deactivated by the conversion electron energy. The microparticles remain active and are engulfed again by nearby synoviocytes and macrophages for sustained action against inflammation. Synovitin OA microparticles decay to harmless inert tin, but its clinical effects last up to a year with just one injection providing durable pain and inflammation relief and helping to restore active living. Okay. Um, we got some feedback that you guys couldn't hear me very well. So it was a great opportunity for me to switch the headset and hopefully um, everybody can hear me. Can you not hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So hopefully that um, video helped you understand the mechanism of action of synovitin. So like I mentioned, this has been pretty well studied uh, in dogs. And actually, if you compare it to any of the other products that we are injecting into joints these days, this has significantly more research um, backing it up. So there were three prospective multi-center studies looking at client-owned dogs, specifically with elbow OA. So when this product comes out, it's technically labeled for elbow OA because that's honestly the joint that we have the most trouble with. We don't have a, a great surgical solution for it. But these studies were done at um, Louisiana State University, University of Missouri, and Gulf Coast um, Veterinary Specialist in Texas. And they looked at the CBPI, which is a client brief pain inventory, force plate analysis, and orthopedic exam. And 70 to 90% of dogs showed improvement up to one year. And what they found is the dogs that were showing 90 or 90% 90 improvement or showing better improvement had more mild to moderate OA. So there's a benefit to actually treating this earlier in the disease process rather than waiting till it's kind of too late to try and modify that synovial lining in that process. And in these studies, and there were also some preclinical studies um, looking at dogs and actually looking at injecting it outside of the joint and what happens is, are there any um, any negative effects. And there really were no um, adverse effects seen in any of these trials. So the indications, like I mentioned, it's technically going to be indicated for elbows, um, though I am positive that we will wind up injecting it in other joints. And um, specifically for elbows, because we do often do arthroscopy, we want to wait at least four weeks after any sort of surgery before we do an injection. Ideally, we're going to be looking for those mild to moderate cases because those are going to be the ones that can are going to have um, a, generally a better outcome. Now, are we going to treat dogs that are asymptomatic? That's, that's probably a stretch. I, I doubt that. But the earlier cases are probably going to be ones that we're going to start. And one of the, tri the clinical trials that was done was actually gave dogs re-injection. So they could come back a year later and get another injection. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how often we need to repeat that, but it'll be a yearly dose to start. Um, and then other joints, like I mentioned, I'm positive we'll have knees and hips um, that also need injection. So just a, a couple points about radiation risks. The um, amount of radiation in the body or, you know, the, the that is measured is, is measured in millirems. And most Americans are exposed or receive about 620 millirems per year just due to living. Um, and that's due to radon, cosmic rays, the earth. There's a big, big um, difference on where you live. So if you live in Denver, you're exposed to a whole lot more radiation than you are here in Seattle. Um, and then there's actually this picture down at the bottom is uh, Guadapari, Brazil, which has a natural radioactive sand of 17,500 millirem. So um, probably don't want to spend a lot of time on that beach. But the point here is that just kind of setting a comparison of what the dogs will what sort of radioactivity the dogs will have. Um, and that's between 40 and 90 millirems per the whole year after treatment. And this is another example of kind of where that fits in to things that we're familiar with. So if you or I have a whole body CT, we're going to be exposed to a thousand millirems. Um, if we have just a chest, 
CT or chest x-ray is about 10. And so the synovitin treatment fits kind of right in here, this 40 to 90. And that 40 to 90 really depends on the size of the dog and therefore the size of the dose that they're getting. A few logistics. So as you can imagine, using a nuclear medicine or radiopharmaceutical, there's going to be some logistics involved. And the first is that you have to have a radioactive materials license. So this is not going to be a product that is going to be um, in every practice. I will tell you there are a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, I started the process of being able to use this last August by attending a three-day um, course on nuclear medicine, um, which as a surgeon was not super awesome for me, but um, it was important to learn uh, nuclear physics um, and then go through all of this testing to apply for a radioactive materials license, which I applied for in March. And we were expecting that by now we would have that license, but then COVID hit. And so the Department of Health um, has surely had better things on their plate uh, than granting us our, our RAM license. But uh, hopefully any day now, you know, I'm honestly not holding my breath. I don't think it'll be this year, but as soon as we get it, we will be the, the first practice in, um, in probably certainly the state of Washington, if not the West Coast. So what will need to happen is um, clients will need to have a cons consultation with me um, at, at least two weeks prior to any treatment. And we need to make sure that the dog is an appropriate candidate and the client's appropriate because they can't be pregnant and you can't have uh, children under the age of 18 um, interacting with a dog for about two to three weeks afterwards. So there's a lot of the, the questioning that goes on with the client um, to make sure that it's the right thing for them. But uh, some other logistics on the positive side is the dogs can go home the same day. So again, un very much unlike cats in I-131, dogs go home the same day. They don't have to be separated from other dogs um, in the hospital environment. They don't have to be separated from other dogs in the home environment. They don't have any limitations to their activity. So they can go back to the same level of, of activity as they were the day before injection. There are some limitations to the humans, and this just comes from the Nuclear Regulatory Agency. And the these are going to, again, depend on the size of the dog and the size of dose that they received. But in general, it's going to be about two weeks where the worst part is the clients can't sleep with the dog. And what I, you know, I try and think about is most of the time when we do surgery, we don't ideally want the dog sleeping with the owners for at least two weeks, if not uh, three months in their recovery period. So, but there are some clients out there that are going to be absolutely adamant that that's not something that they can give up, and in which case it's not going to be the right product for them. But I think there's going to be a whole lot of dogs out there that um, may be able to benefit from this. So this is stuff that we will be talking to the clients about in that kind of pre-injection um, pre visit. All right, so that's Synovitin. I'm sure there's gonna be some questions that come up, so throw them into the Q&A. And I'm gonna move on to nerve growth factor. So nerve growth factor is a cytokine that is naturally produced in the body and is a very important part of normal development of the nervous system in basically the fetus and embryo in very young patients or young um, animals. But once adulthood sets in, uh, the primary role of the NGF now switches to more pro nociception. So it's now a mediator of pain. So there is a lot of research, tons of research uh, on the human side and kind of spilling in over to the veterinary side about, well, is this a, an opportunity to, to, you know, intervene with this target compared to PGE or IL-1? Is this a target that we can eliminate and then decrease the, um, the nociceptive or pain response? So the role of NGF in, in, in OA pain is that there are basically nerve, free nerve endings in the subchondral bone and in the synovium. Uh, so there's no nerve endings in the cartilage. That's always something important to know. There's these free nerve endings and they have these receptors called TRK-A, um, T -R -K -A, and that's the receptor where the NGF binds to. So when NGF binds this trick A receptor, it, it is internalized by the nerve ending and it shuttles its way up to the nerve body and the dorsal root ganglion, and it increases the sensitivity to pain. So it, in other words, it lowers that threshold for a painful sensation. So it, you know, causes pain. Um, and it leads to this development of central sens sensitization and maladaptive pain, which is 
went that slide early on, I said, what we're really, really trying to avoid is that development of central sensitization. So once central sensitization happens, it's much, much harder to treat. The other thing that happens with NGF is it also binds to these TRK-A receptors on inflammatory cells. So these receptors are present on our macrophages, um, uh, mast cells. So NGF binds to these guys and then actually perpetuates the inflammatory process. So it creates the release of even further NGF and then a release of more prostaglandin E and again, just really perpetuates this vicious cycle. So how could we target NGF? Um, we could remove the free NGF, which is what we're going to talk more about, prevent the binding, or just prevent trick A activation. And so it's the, the monoclonal antibody therapy, which you, probably everybody has heard of, uh, especially in recent days. Um, uh, it's you know, really what people are looking at for, for treating COVID. Um, in this area in Seattle, you know, Fred Hutch is doing a lot of work with monoclonals in different areas. Um, but a monoclonal antibody to specifically the NGF um, cytokine is the area that's getting the most interest for targeting this as a anti-pain strategy. And so there have been studies in dogs and cats. And if anybody wants to read more about NGF and uh, NGF monoclonal antibodies, this is a great article. Um, so what is a monoclonal antibody? So basically, you know, we think about our, our antibodies are produced in response to, um, you know, an infection, a, a virus. We've got our B cells that create these, these antibodies, and they are specifically targeted to the thing that's bad for simplicity's sake. There, historically, when monoclonal antibodies were first coming out, they were mostly kind of rodent mon monoclonal antibodies. So when you would inject them into a human or, or another species, there could be an immune reaction. But over the last decade or so, there's been a lot of really promising research that has made humanized and canonized and felinized monoclonal antibodies, meaning that they are specifically all dog monoclonal and all cat monoclonal. So that, that immune reaction is far less likely to occur. So what happens in the case of NGF is this monoclonal antibody, whether it's the dog version or the cat version, binds to the NGF and it prevents the NGF from binding to the trick A receptor and then all of the bad things that happen after that. So like I mentioned, this is a therapy that is, um, there have been studies in dogs and cats. Um, the pilot studies are available, they've been published and they show, um, you know, very promising results and improvements in clinical signs four to six weeks after a single injection. And I should specify that these injections are, so there have been studies using either sub-Q or IV, and I honestly don't know what the final product label is going to be, but it's not intra-articular. So it's a systemic injection. Um, so improvement in clinical signs, um, you know, if you read the papers, they say that the um, improvement was as good or better than NSAIDs. So we're all eagerly awaiting the FDA approval. Um, again, FDA has had a lot on their plate this year as well. So I honestly don't know uh, when this is going to be coming out, but, and this is complete speculation, but if I had to guess, it would probably be next year, um, just based on uh, the, the, the research that's coming out. So this will be a product that's going to be used in general practice. So this is not going to be something that you're going to be referring to us for. The closest thing I can compare it to is Cytopoint. Um, so it's brought to you by the same company that brought out Cytopoint. So I think it's gonna be a very similar um, product that's used in practice. All right, so finally, the treatment modality that uh, we don't have to wait for, because this picture was taken last Friday uh, in front of our building here, Animal Surgical, and that is a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Um, so uh, I can tell you it has made its way inside. Um, wasn't easy, but it did. So why hyperbaric oxygen? Um, just a quick reminder. Well, you know, it just seems obvious, right? We, we need oxygen to live, but, but why is that? So oxygen combines with, you know, basically our fuels, um, you know, the food that we eat, carbohydrates, protein, um, they combine in the cell and it is involved in cellular respiration. So aerobic metabolism. And this is what allows our muscles to function, our brains to function, our hearts to be, you know, we I don't have to hammer home to a group of veterinarians um, and technicians that we need oxygen to live. 
So the next part is, you know, most of our body is made up of oxygen. So if we look at all of the different components of oxygen, you know, we've got 65% of our body made up of oxygen. But the question I throw out is, all right, if oxygen is so important to us um, for our daily functions and um, our, everything in our body, what percent of oxygen um, or what percent of room air is oxygen? Um, and I know that everyone watching this at some point knew the exact answer, but maybe you forgot. Um, and it's actually only about 21% of room air is what we what we're breathing in in terms of oxygen. The rest is mostly nitrogen and then all of these other things. So then what happens after we breathe in room air or if we breathe in oxygen, what happens to that? Well, the oxygen binds to hemoglobin and each, hem each hemoglobin molecule has four binding sites for oxygen. And we measure the percentage of binding of our hemoglobin by measuring our pulse ox. So if we have all of our hemoglobins bound, so all the four sites on each hemoglobin, every single, single hemoglobin is bound, that gives us 100% pulse ox, 100% binding. Um, so normal is going to be somewhere around 98%. Ideally, we're striving for 100, but room air, it's probably somewhere at 98, 99. So then blood is delivered to the body and at, you know, at the tissues, the hemoglobin offloads the oxygen, right? And then we've got deoxygenated blood comes back to the, um, to the heart. So the tissue oxy ox oxygenation, um, so how much oxygen is delivered to the tissues and is available uh, really depends on a few things. So how much oxygen is breathed in? So obviously there's a big difference between breathing room air 21% or breathing 100% oxygen. So how much is breathed in? The blood flow to the tissue. So if we have good blood flow, we're going to have good oxygen delivery. If we have ischemia or decreased um, blood flow, we're going to have poor oxygen delivery. Our hematocrit, so how many red blood cells are there? And then within the red blood cells, how many hemoglobin molecules are there? So what is the actual oxygen carrying capacity of the blood? Um, consumption of oxygen from one area to another. So if you, um, if all of the oxygen is offloaded at one site because it happens to be um, in greater need. And then downstream, there may not be quite as much oxygen available for the tissues downstream from there. And then lastly, diffusion distance. And this is mostly and most commonly related to edema. So if we have interstitial edema, that's going to increase the diffusion distance from a capillary to the cells that need the oxygen. So all of that is how oxygen gets to the to the tissues that are needed. Hypoxia is where there's not enough to oxygen. So not enough oxygen um, in the lungs or getting to the tissues. And obviously tissues need oxygen to survive and they need even more oxygen to heal. And again, kind of uh, these days, hypoxia is making, um, you know, I think more people understand what that word means now. And there's this whole phenomenon that I, I don't know the answer to, but they're finding that, um, people that have coronavirus have this high, uh, happy hypoxia where they um, may have a, you know, an SpO2 that's, that's very low or a PaO2 that's much lower than um, would be considered uh, normal or certainly healthy. And yet they're, they're not having um, the symptoms that one would expect. But back to hyperbaric and, and animals, what we can do here. So how could we get more oxygen to the tissues? So the body naturally can do this by increasing our cardiac output. So we do that by increasing our stroke volume or increasing the heart rate. So that's going to be the instant natural reflex of the body. We can increase the hematocrit or hemoglobin, and we would do that by giving a blood transfusion. Or we can increase the amount of oxygen in the blood. And this is, believe me, I'm... Remember, I'm a surgeon, so it was uh, it was a lot of work to go back and, and try and re try and remember what even these these letters all meant, the CaO2. But really, what it all comes down to is we're trying to increase the amount of oxygen in the blood to get it to the tissues. And if we have a hundred percent of our oxygen or a hundred percent of our hemoglobin already bound, we've got a good hematocrit, and that, that's already doing what it's doing. Is there any way that we could get it dissolved in the plasma? And that's the trick to hyperbaric oxygen. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is the delivery of 100% oxygen at an increased pressure. And because there's a couple pretty cool physics laws that I'll share with you in a couple slides, we can increase the dissolved oxygen in the plasma. So it has, now has nothing to do with the hematocrit or hemoglobin. It's actually dissolving that oxygen just in the plasma, and it gets it to the tissues um, uh, more effectively. 
So just a couple of the, the laws that make it possible to do this. There's one called Boyle's law, which really just means that as you increase the pressure, so this is why we have to apply the pressure, hyperbaric, as you apply pressure, it decreases the volume and increases the density. So in other words, if you have a given space and you apply pressure from the outside, it shrinks down the volume, but the um, density inside that is greater. So what this means is we can have a greater density of oxygen in a smaller space so we can provide even more oxygen. Okay. The second law is the amazing law that gives us fizzy water. And that is if you put enough pressure on a gas molecule, the gas can diffuse into liquid. So we can make fizzy water. But if we put these two um, these two laws together, we can increase the pressure and then put that pressure on the oxygen molecules. It, it basically dissolves the oxygen into plasma and it increases the ability to deliver oxygen in the blood. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is, again, the delivery of 100% oxygen at two um, ATA, which is equivalent to basically, if you're familiar with diving, it's about diving 33 feet. Um, so it's not super deep, but there's definitely some pressure that's involved. And by doing this, it increases the dissolved oxygen in the plasma up to about 15 times. And it therefore increases the um, rate of delivery to the oxygen to the cells. And that oxygen um, delivery, it, it remains elevated um, even hours after the treatment has concluded. So the benefits, there's a number of them. And actually I'll start at the bottom and say that hyperbaric oxygen therapy was first um, you know, designed to treat people that were having diving accidents. So you know, um, the bends where they would need to get into the uh, hyperbaric ox oxygen chamber if they came up too quickly um, from a deep dive. So it would help have, have to depressure them um, or decompression sickness. That's not something that we're going to be using our hyperbaric for. What we want to use it for is really the ability to increase that oxygen to the tissues to improve tissue healing, but it also helps the function of white blood cells. So it helps with oxidative healing um, oxi or oxidative killing, increases angiogenesis. So again, back to the whole idea of, of improving healing at, at the tissues. Um, it decreases the ability of anaerobic bacteria to function. So that makes sense. And it actually helps the function of certain antibiotics it helps them work a little bit better, including uh, our fluoroquinolones. And then it can de actually decrease edema. And this is a, con a condition that um, hyperbarics use a lot for in areas that have, um, that see patients with snake bite injuries. And this is a picture here of a dog from Florida that was bit on the face. And um, I did my training all in Florida. So I used to see a lot of snake bites and um, whether it was a limb or the face, the edema was really profound. So you can put a dog into a hyperbaric chamber and um, even in one treatment have a significant improvement in their, um, in their edema. So the indications, again, really anything to do with tissue healing, but you'll also come across a lot of things like pancreatitis and snake mite and heat stroke and encephalitis and aortic aneurysm um, and all these FDA approvals for, um, for humans. And you think, well, why on earth is a orthopedic and rehab practice uh, excited about getting hyperbaric because they probably don't want to see pancreatitis, which is very true. We don't. Um, so why would we want to use it here? And the reason is there's actually a lot of emerging research showing the benefits of hyperbaric for treating chronic pain and for treating muscle and tendon injuries, especially in athletes. So in humans, they found that anywhere from two weeks to two months of hyperbaric treatment has shown significant improvement in people with fibromyalgia pain or um, uh, myofascial pain. They've also found improvement with people with headaches and neuralgia. Uh, they looked, they looked at humans, um, athletes that have muscle injuries and they can have decreased um, kind of blood, uh, the measurements of, of muscle injury by treating Putting them in hyperbaric, the blood measurements of tissue injury are decreased and the pain is improved after just a few treatments. So I was actually, um, the reason we got this is, is a com the company approached me last um, January because they were really interested in doing some research looking at the treatment of dogs um, or cats with osteoarthritis using hyperbaric because the, they had been doing some studies looking at diabetes and the animals that were placed in the chamber for treatment for diabetes 
what the clients were reporting is that, yeah, it's kind of helped with their insulin need, but this is like a brand new dog. They're running around, their mobility's improved. They don't need their NSAIDs. So we have yet to do an, a study yet um, in dogs. We don't have that information yet, but that's um, one of the big reasons why we got this here is to try and answer that question. So the indications that we're going to be accepting are, you know, obviously anything orthopedic. So pain management, uh, tendon and muscle muscle injuries. I think that's going to be an area where I'm really excited to see what it can do in some of our, our, our challenging uh, tendon and muscle con uh, conditions. Certainly infections. Now, none of us ever want to see infections, but they happen. Uh, so that'll be one that we'll be seeing. And then edema. Uh, also neurologic conditions. So part of the, the rehab side, we obviously see a lot of dogs that have um, disc disease, whether it's post-op or non-op, increasing oxygen to the spinal cord can help healing there. FCE, so we don't have a surgical treatment for that, but FCE can also be a, a, you know, an indication for this. And then cognitive dysfunction. So they're looking at hyperbaric for treatment of Alzheimer's and cognitive dysfunction in humans. And again, some of the anecdotal evidence that's come out uh, on the veterinary side is that pets with cognitive dysfunction can have improvement with hyperbaric treatment. And then of course, wounds. Um, that's where really kind of the foundation of hyperbaric is. Contraindications, the big huge one is pneumothorax. So if you can imagine there's this empty space in the chest cavity and you apply all those laws of physics, uh, bad things can happen. But there's also some other relative contraindications. So if the pet is very sick. Well, first of all, if it's a very sick patient, um, we're probably not the right clinic for them, um, especially if they're going to be confined in an area where we can't get to them quickly. So any risk of aspiration. Uncontrolled seizures. Um, so I'm going to, I'll show you in the next slides. So oxygen induced seizures is one of the, the risks associated with hyperbaric. So if you have a dog that has a seizure history and that it's uncontrolled, there may not be the right candidate. Um, pregnancy, again, don't want to go there. Um, and then basically other things are, are going to be where there's an area where air can get trapped. And so um, sinusitis, um, severe sinus infections or middle ear disease, we're going to be very cautious with those patients. So again, potential complications, barotrauma. So that's um, kind of uh, trauma to the, to the ear. Containment anxiety. So this is a picture of the unit here, this little Boston Terrier in it. And um, so, like I said, our unit arrived on Friday. We have not used it, but in talking to a lot of my colleagues around the country that have used this, they reassure me that it's really uncommon for a dog or cat to be nervous. Um, and, and usually they go in the chamber and feel quite the opposite. It feels like a secure um, uh, cage and there's some kind of white noise happening. So we plan to give all of our patients um, trazodone plus or minus gabapentin. Um, we, we do practice fear-free, so we're going to be very, very, very diligent about making sure that um, the patients have an, an as enjoyable experience as possible. Uh, but then the seizures, and um, again, I don't think they're common at all, but uh, the, the treatment for those seizures is basically once you reduce the oxygen and you, you stop the treatment, the seizures stop. So it's not something that we're causing epilepsy or causing any long-term damage, but that's something that we are aware of. So the logistics, um, the, one of the things I'm so excited to uh, also kind of announce to the world is we have a new rehab vet on staff here who also happens to be a board certified uh, emergency and critical care specialist. And that's Dr. Michelle Savigny. And she is really gonna be the one kind of heading up the hyperbaric treatments. Um, so rest assured if uh, those rare cases of, of seizures happen, you've got a critical care specialist uh, on your hands. Um, so we will be scheduling these through sound. So you're not gonna call the surgical side, we'll call uh, the sound side and there will be an initial consultation. And whether it's a, a patient that you're sending just purely for hyperbaric or hyperbaric plus you know, a whole rehab consult, pain management consult, we'll schedule that accordingly. Generally gonna be somewhere around 10 to 20 treatments. And then you can see the cost here, which is um, very comparable to, to other units um, in, in the area. And many insurance plans will cover hyperbaric like most of our rehab um, treatments. So what you're going to be getting in your inbox, just kind of a summary of, um, of the, the tools that I've talked about that can hopefully help you guys with your OA cases, that screening exam tool, uh, the instruction to join care, caninearthritis.org, a checklist for comprehensive care. So really what this checklist is meant for you guys to do is say, um, 
you know, have I educated the client on OA? Have I started an NSAID? Have I started Adequan? Basically kind of going through all the checklist of stuff that um, we hope that, that you are going to be doing and you can be doing um, before thinking that they need necessarily to come, come to a specialty hospital. So ho hoping to work with you guys to, to kind of get that comprehensive care happening um, before they need to come see us. And then guidelines for when to refer and kind of who to refer to. So when do you refer to surgery? And then when do you refer to the sound side for intraarticular therapy or for hyperbarics? And so we've created some, um, some nice checklists that you're going to be getting in your email here soon. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions. And um, as I said, I'll kind of play this little cat video in the background while I answer some of these questions here. All right. Um, Oh, great. First one is, uh, when should a small breed uh, puppy or dog with asymptomatic MPL be referred for a consult? That's a great question. So in our, um, in the when to refer document that you're going to be getting, we are suggesting that you refer to surgery for a grade two, three, or four MPL. A grade one MPL, we're generally not going to recommend surgery for those. But MPLs are tricky. Um, so what I tend to say is when the MPL becomes really clinically relevant, if it's every couple months, the dog has a little hop or skip and otherwise it's just totally fine. We're, we're usually not going to intervene there, but if it's a grade two, certainly a grade three, uh, those we, we generally will recommend surgery for those grade fours are a whole other can of worms. Um, but those we'd want to have conversations about. Um, all right, next question is, is Synovitin di uh, different from Adequan? Um, yes, completely different. Uh, so Adequan, as we know, is a polysulfated glycosaminoglycan that's injected uh, either intramuscularly or sub-Q. And the way that um, that works is by inhibiting the matrix metalloproteinases. I picture them like little MMPs. These are the little guys that eat away at the cartilage. So that's how Adequan works. And Synovitin is working by um, injecting directly into the joint and those macrophages and synovia sites, again, engulf the synovitin and deactivate those cells that are releasing the pro-inflammatory products. Um, kind of a segue to this, and I don't know if um, uh, this question will come up, but would we be using those two concurrently? I think I probably would um, and will be until I get more experience with synovitin. I probably, if a dog's already on Adequan, I'm probably still going to keep them on Adequan while they're getting synovitin. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Next one. Uh, tin is a metal and some of us are allergic to it, have reactions to it. What are the chances of this in a patient? Really great question. And I think there's just, um, what I can say is in the studies that have been done in dogs and, um, there's what I mentioned, there was, I think 69 clinical dogs. There's been hundreds of dogs that were, um, include those clinical dogs and preclinical dogs. And they did not see any allergic type reactions to that. But I think it's like any medication, you know, that annoying thing where it says, um, use caution if you're allergic to this drug. And how do you know if you're allergic to that drug unless you take it? So um, I think it's one of these things where it's probably unlikely uh, and it hasn't been seen yet, but as it becomes more common and, and more commonly used, would that be something that would show up possibly? Yeah. Um, all right, for Synovitin, does the patient have to be anesthetized or just sedated? So just like any of our joint injections, um, it really is dog dependent. And I have some dogs that um, were able to just do a little, so we do gabapentin and trazodone before any, any procedure here. And some dogs, we can just do a low dose of Torb and a, a local block and do an intraarticular injection. Um, and we have some dogs that or just a little bit more anxious um, and they do need to have a brief anesthesia. So it will be no different than our current intraarticular therapies, whether it's PRP or, or stem cells, it's gonna be patient dependent and we set the clients up for either heavy sedation or a very brief anesthesia. Um, all right, more Synovitin logistics. Uh, no limitations to post-injection activity. So the owners do not have to keep the dog kenneled or crated and restricted walking and jumping, correct. So there's no restrictions to what the dog can do from uh, the standpoint of running, jumping. They don't have to be confined. And this is different than what we generally recommend actually with PRP. Usually with PRP, we have dogs somewhat restricted for about two weeks. Um, the reason for that is honestly, I've taken it from what's recommended on the human side. 
in the Synovitin trials, there was no restrictions for the dogs, their activity. The restrictions are all about the interaction between the client, um, the human client and, um, and their, their, um, their dog. There's no restrictions about dogs cuddling with other dogs or other pets. Um, okay, Synovitin max number of joints as many dogs have bilateral sifil and hippo weight. Yeah, so Synovitin is going to be generally a two joint treatment. Um, that again, it's going to depend on the size of the dog and the size of the treatment, but usually it's going to be a two joint treatment because um, anything more than that may increase the amount of radioactivity that they can have. But a lot of the studies uh, or some of the studies were done giving two elbows. Uh, and so I'll be happy to inject bilateral stifles or bilateral hips or one elbow and one hip or whatever combination it is. Uh, HBOT, any noise that the, the pets would be sensitive while in the chamber? Um, no, that any noise is, it's more, um, it's very, very similar to an oxygen cage. So just kind of that white noise where you can hear a little bit of the hissing of, of an oxygen cage, but it's not any sort of anything that would be off-putting to them. Um, uh, has hyperbaric been used in these old arthritic dogs that have multi-joint OA that are already on polypharmacy? Yeah, absolutely. And so um, these, these are going to be the cases I think that us here internally were most excited about is these dogs that we're kind of throwing everything we already have at them. And is this going to help us um, with, those, with those patients? So I don't have the research to say that, yes, we can put, the, this is what we should expect, but um, my, my two primary kind of friends and colleagues that use this, one is um, where I, I used to work at the University of Florida. They have a hyperbaric chamber there and they put a lot of their, I mean, almost all of their rehab cases or tons of their rehab cases go through it. And a lot of those are geriatric cases that are on this polypharmacy. Um, another is a good friend of mine in Missouri who's a rehab vet and same thing. So she puts a lot of these uh, geriatric or, or polyarthritis poly OA cases in uh, to treat. So I think that's going to be our, our plan. Um, and, and maybe uh, certainly a goal is always to um, potentially reduce the amount of polypharmacy that they need. So could we potentially lower the dose of NSAIDs that they need or the frequency that they need it? That would be really cool. Uh, do I know if there's a product like Synovitin being developed or researched in cats? Um, mind managing cats difficult since long-term NSAID is not advised. So I don't know that they're doing any specific trials with Synovitin and cats. Um, the good news is the, the anti-NGF monoclonal antibody is very specifically being looked at and developed for cats. So that's going to be game changing for our cats. Um, Synovitin, um, I don't know of any research or anything looking at it in cats yet. I do expect that once it's out and once we're very comfortable with it in dogs, um, we'll probably be trying it in cats. Uh, I'm always looking for cats to inject PRP um, or HA or stem cells, and we just rarely see those cats come through. So I'm happy to, to try using those in, in cats with OA. How often would hyperbaric oxygen treatments be recommended? <sighs> this really varies too. And so you will see some conditions that are treated a couple times a day um, versus a couple times a week. For us here, we're going to be looking at uh, several times a week. It's unlikely that we'll be doing multiple day dives or treatments, um, but we'll probably be looking at two to three times a week um, uh, for that kind of 10 to 20 treatment period. Uh, Synovitin lasts up to a year. Um, how long the ch how, how long does the chamber effects last? That we don't know. So there's a very big difference between what we know about Synovitin and what we know about the chamber. So Synovitin has really good research in dogs with arthritis because it was been developed specifically for that. The chamber, we're getting that as um, because there's a lot of very good anecdotal research or anecdotal evidence um, because other conditions have been treated and the animals seem to have less pain. Um, but we're hoping oh, we, we should be starting a clinical trial in the new year looking at treating dogs with arthritis um, specifically so we can answer these questions. Uh, cost of, of Synovitin. I don't know that yet, but what I've been told is that it will be less than stem cell therapy, but more than PRP. And so if we do a PRP two elbows here, that's probably going to be 1500 to 2000. If we do stem cells, it's going to be probably about 4000. So my guess, and this is again, this is going to be dependent on the cost of the drug, but my guess is it's going to be about a $3,000 treatment. 
Um, don't hold me to that yet, though. Um, Are these treatments available in human medicine? I know hyperbaric is, but what about the others? Do, do I treat humans? <laughs> um, uh, Synovitin is in development for humans. So the company that's making Synovitin, they have a human equivalent or division. And if you go to the website, um, synovitin.com is a Synovitin one, but, uh, and I can send out uh, the, the references for the human side, but there's a lot. Uh, actually, look at Exubrion. Exubrion Therapeutics is kind of the company that made Synovitin. And if through their website, you can probably find the human one, but there's a lot of research. So I know it's in development for humans, specifically the, the TIN 117, um, 117M. Like I mentioned in Europe, they've been using a different radioactive um, material for what's called radio synovial orthesis, um, the, uh, the actually active giving this into the joint to restore the synovial lining. They've been doing it in, in Germany for years. So yes, it technically is available. Monoclonal antibodies, yes, it is in development for humans. So uh, again, it's kind of in the stages of, F of clinical trials and FDA approval. I don't know whether it'll be approved for humans or dogs and cats first, um, but I think they're probably neck and neck of when that's coming. Okay. Um, do I know how hyperbaric oxygen compares to ozone therapy for OA treatment? I don't. Um, I don't have any experience with ozone therapy. Um, so, and I've not read any head to head studies comparing the two. So I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that one. Um, uh, oh, Adequan question I always get. So my protocol for Adequan is twice weekly for four weeks, then once monthly, I am. Response decreases after going monthly. Can injections be given weekly indefinitely? Can Adequan be given sub-Q? Uh, yes, to all of those. So my protocol for Adequan is, so I should start by saying that Adequan is labeled to be given I am. I don't think I've ever given it I am or recommended um, because of the discomfort that comes along with it. And because there is research, it's not part of the FDA label and your Adequan rep will never tell you you can give it sub-Q because legally they're not allowed to, but there is research to show that it will get to the joint. There's just not efficacy studies with sub-Q or the pharmacology ones. But yes, I exclusively give it sub-Q. I do twice a week for four weeks. And then I used to do the twice a week for four weeks and then straight to once a month. But what I've started to do in the last year or two is do more of a taper where we do twice a week for four weeks, then once a week for four weeks, and then once every other week. And we're trying to get to a point where um, what I find is a lot, a lot of owners will notice that, yeah, you know, about after three weeks, they seem a little bit more stiff. So we say, all right, well, you give it every three weeks. And so to your question, can it be given as frequently as, as, frequently as weekly? Yes. Um, just in the last couple of weeks, I've had uh, a couple of dogs that were on that once a month. Um, strategy and we bump them back to every two weeks or, or even once a week just because clients their feedback is that you know they seem to do a lot better after aliquan and then it just tends to run out so hopefully that answered that question um what is the estimated cost of each injection i assume it varies by weight but just curious if there's a rest estimate i think that question is specific to synovitin and, and probably what i answered again that it's um the cost of each injection is probably probably going to be in the $3,000 realm. But again, I still don't know from the company what the cost of the product is going to be. Um, and that would be a once a year treatment. Uh, what about hyper hyperbaric and degenerative myelopathy dogs um, or dogs like wobblers? Um, DM, I'm definitely curious about that. So I, um, I haven't seen any specific research about it, but I think that's probably something we'd be absolutely willing to give it a try. Uh, wobblers, the only thing with wobblers is for me, and this is something where I would definitely want Dr. Savigny's input too, is um, how kind of unstable they are, um, how clinically affected they are, um, whether if they had something like a seizure in the, in the chamber, would it make their condition worse? So um, we'll get back to you on the Wobblers one, but I think DM, yeah, we would definitely be trying that. Um, Okay, under the principle of treat as young or soon as possible, would Synovitin be uh, appropriate for younger patients, i.e. two to three year old German Shepherd dogs? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think those that's probably gonna be the best time frame to get them. Uh, if, if we have a diagnosis of uh, 
an arthritic joint, the earlier, the better is what is the guidelines that are being suggested now based on that research showing that the earlier treated animals had a better success rate. Um, and then again, kind of the, the thought process, especially, you know, if it's a German shepherd, that's a working dog, being able to keep them in, um, in their job as long as possible. I know that the military is looking at Synovitin very closely as well for their working dogs and hoping that they're going to be able to, to stay active uh, a lot longer. Any known health conditions that contraindicate the anti-NGF treatment? Great question. Not that I'm aware of right now, but this is one of these ones where it's a little, it's frustrating for us because we're on the outside of a company that is um, awaiting FDA approval. And so they can only share so much with us um, because the FDA is very, very, uh, you know, there's a lot of regulation that goes in there. So I don't know what the label is going to say, what there's, there's going to be any contraindication. So I'm waiting to hear that same answer too. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions. So again, thank you guys all so, so much for taking time out of your day. You are going to get um, an email again with uh, several um, tools for you guys, but also in the email is going to be a survey that asks you about your experience with this. Um, you feel free to say there were technical glitches. We know it and we were really sorry and we will work um, tirelessly uh, so the next time um, doesn't happen. But what we really want to know is what you want to learn about, what we can help um, you know, share with you guys next time around and um, you know, any other feedback that you have. So thank you all so much. Uh, stay well, take care. And I look forward to the day that we can be seeing you in person. So. Bye, everyone.